Welcome to our second session in our Ducks in a Row series. Today we're going to be covering state planning. My name is Beverly and I'm the Communications Manager for People's Memorial Association and I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. PMA would like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Coast Salish, Duwamish, and Suquamish nations on which we work and live. As you might know, Though our office is physically located in Seattle and most of our staff and volunteers serve the surrounding areas, we uh, actually do serve the entire state of Washington. Oh, looks like folks are having some difficulty hearing me. Let me see, one second, let me tinker with my settings. Okay, hopefully that helps a little bit. Before we begin, I'll just cover a couple of standard housekeeping items. For today's presentation, I'm going to go ahead and have us all stay on mute in um, oh, another chat. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have us all stay on mute, cuts down on the dishes and the dogs in the background. But no worries, we understand if you've got some distractions at home or at work, we are recording today's presentation. So no worries if you miss something in your notes, we'll be sending out the recording of this along with our presenter slides for you to refer back to. I imagine we've all got a whole lot of questions for our presenter today, so please feel free to drop your questions into the chat box or even use the Q&A feature if you'd like. Uh, if you're a little on the shy side, please feel free to send your question directly to me and I will keep your name anonymous. I know one thing that I always think whenever I watch an estate planning presentation is that I need a little time to digest the information because there's so much. So don't worry if you can't quite think of what your question is later, we'll also make sure you have contact information for People's Memorial, as well as our speaker, Tiffany, so you can follow up with either of us with your question once you've had a second to mull it over. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We're so excited to have you. Just a little bit of background about People's Memorial Association. We are the oldest and largest memorial society in the United States. We were founded in 1939 right here in Seattle. Right now, we are the only nonprofit in Washington that provides funeral education and consumer advocacy services. But if you're joining us from a little further afield, if you're not, there's about 60 other organizations under the umbrella of the National Funeral Consumers Alliance. So it's distinctly possible there's another organization a little closer to you who's doing some very similar work. For us here at PMA, over 216,000 people have become members in our 83 year history. And of those folks, about 71,000 of them are still living. So we stay very busy in the office. When we think about how we serve all of those folks, well, one of the biggest things we do is we offer educational resources, classes like this, as well as a whole, whole bevy of resources hosted on our website, our Facebook, our Instagram, our Twitter. I'm working on getting this up on TikTok even. So we're just trying to reach out to people and meet them where they're at and get them the information they need to make informed choices. To that end, one of the things that keeps us pretty busy is our state level legislative lobbying work. We advocate for increased choices and in funeral options, price transparency in a notoriously opaque industry is very important to us. And we also work to protect the cultural rights of all Washingtonians. We're just really blessed here with a diversity of peoples of all backgrounds and faiths, and they all deserve access to affordable and dignified final disposition, and they deserve to be able to practice the, um, the different things that meet their spiritual and emotional needs, whatever that might look like. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about that, please feel free to visit our website. Uh, we'd love it if maybe you'd consider becoming a member. Uh, it's very affordable. There's just a one-time membership fee of $50 per person, and then you're stuck with us for life. For most folks, the major benefit of becoming a member is discounted rates on those uh, final disposition options. There's about 25 contracted funeral homes around the state of Washington that we've partnered up with, as well as four contracted cemeteries, a pet funeral home, a virtual memorial service, a monuments company, just a little bit of everything. We've worked really hard to pre-screen all these businesses for you to try and reduce some of the stress of making these purchases and identifying the things that are just right for you. And we don't want you when you're grieving to be confronted by a sort of used car sales experience. It's hard on a good day, no easier when you're grieving. One of the things we're pretty proud of at PMA is that our members actually share ownership of the co-op funeral home right here in Seattle. This is one of the only co-op funeral homes in the country. So this is a pretty unique business model and we're just always looking for a reason to sing its praises. So today, as I mentioned, is the second session in a whole series. 
We had a session on Monday all about advanced care planning, where we learned all about advanced directives for healthcare. Then on Friday, we're going to be meeting up again to discuss funeral options. Physically, what are you? What can you do with your body? What are the laws? What are the requirements? And how do I figure out what's right for me? So I hope to be able to see you at that session as well. And even before we get started, I'd just love to say thank you to all of you for joining us. It's community members like all of you that really make PMA what it is. Um, I'd like to encourage you to take a look at our website and if you can make a gift of any size and it will help to support this essential work that we at PMA do to support all Washingtonians at end of life. Now, the real reason all of you are here, I've brought back my friend, Tiffany Gordon. She is a partner at KHBB Law and an excellent attorney. Tiffany, welcome back to PMA. Thank you so much for being here. Hi there, thank you so much for having me, Beverly. Hi everyone. I'll go ahead and hand the screen over to you and I think you're ready to do your thing and hit us with that good, good expertise. All right. Well, let me go ahead and share my screen so everyone can see my slides. All right. So um, thank you so much for joining us again um, this afternoon. And it sounds like this week has been um, a really great duck series so far. And sounds like we'll be rounding out Friday with the third presentation, um, which is fantastic. That's uh, one of the things that I like best about the People's Memorial Association is the educational aspect because um, that is a, a place where I really get to um, help the members and help members of the community um, just kind of understand some of the ins and outs um, of what I do all day, which is estate planning work. Um, as Beverly said, um, feel free to kind of pose your questions throughout. Um, the one request that I'll have is if it's something that's too detailed or tax related um, or really specific to your situation, um, go ahead and just shoot me an email. And that way we can kind of talk through it um, or exchange emails about it rather than um, including it in what might be a long-winded response uh, during our, our limited time together. But otherwise, you know, feel free to feel free to raise your questions um, as we move throughout the presentation. So in this world, nothing is certain but death and taxes. So thanks to Benjamin Franklin, um, we will be talking a lot about death today. Um, and a little bit about taxes. We're going to just cover kind of some basics regarding uh, how the estate tax, uh, what the kind of estate tax parameters and figures are, um, but our pre presentation is really going to focus on more foundational estate planning um, as estate taxes don't affect everybody in the room. But what about estate taxes? So what is that? What is the estate tax? It's a one-time transfer tax is due um, if a decedent's assets reach certain threshold levels. So in Washington state, we have our own estate tax um, and the exemption amount is a little over $2 million, $2,193,000. Um, and we're working on some legislation right now getting pushed through to um, have that uh, be adjusted for um, inflation and kind of cost of living associated with the regional area. As historically, that is um, a tax exemption amount that did indeed, um, it was adjusted every so often. And that um, statute that was associated with that sort of uh, sunsetted a couple of years ago. And so we've been working to <laughs> catch up um, with the legislature to get something in place in order to sort of re-up um, that sort of uh, changes that folks would have historically seen um, so that it can, can catch up each year, um, similar to how the federal exemption um, fluctuates and increases each year. Um, and at this time, the federal estate tax exemption amount for um, 2021 is 11700000 And I don't have an estate tax problem, but I certainly hope to have one at some point in time because <laughs> it means that my assets exceed $11.7 million. Um, Beverly, was there a question? Yeah, um, those are some very large numbers, and I like you <laughs> to have this problem someday. Um, I aspire to tax trouble. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? One of our attendees is curious. This is a big number. Is this the total value of your estate, including your real estate? Yes. Okay. So that's a great question. So what the um, what the estate looks at when you're when we're calculating and talking about estate tax and potential exposure to state tax is really all of your assets. So real estate that you own. Um, life insurance, that's one that people oftentimes forget that, oh, I have this policy for a million dollars and because I don't use it as an asset during my lifetime, 
I may forget to tell my estate planning attorney that I even have it. So that's important because those assets in total, um, investment accounts, retirement accounts, all of the assets that someone owns at their death are going to be looked at um, in terms of calculating what the value is of their estate. Then of course, there's some deductions associated with that, you know, marital deduction, there's, you know, charitable, et cetera. But we're looking at the overall big, big number of all the assets when we're um, talking about what is included in your estate for estate tax purposes. And in Washington, this is just a, a table that shows how that tax is computed. And so when you are looking at um, the actual exemption amount, we talked about it's this 2,193,000, we'll call it 2 million just for ease of conversation. Um, but when what happens is when there's an, ex, an amount beyond that, so say it's zero to a million, then you're at a tax rate of 10%. And it grows, it's graduated, depending on what the level of assets are beyond that exemption amount. And then at the Fed level, um, we have a similar table that is is relatively compressed in terms of the taxable estate being zero to ten thousand, and what the what the percentages look like, and it's eighteen to forty percent for the Fed, um, and that goes up pretty quickly. Whereas uh, at the state level, it's between ten and twenty percent, and so that's what we are. Um, I just wanted to kind of give um, an intro to kind of what the estate tax is because there is a lot of buzz around it. There was a lot of discussion um, with the change of administration as to whether or not, you know, this was going to be significantly reduced at the Fed level, et cetera. And so you've probably heard that word. And just to kind of give you a little bit of an outline of what that actually, what that tax is. Um, and then I see that there's a question of does this include gift tax? So that's a great question. So in Washington, there's no gift tax. What that means is I can gift all day long to any individual that I want to, um, and Washington doesn't care. The Department of Revenue doesn't care. They're not going to know about it. They're not even going to ask me to report it. Um, at, the, at the federal level, there is a gift tax. And how that works is basically when I make lifetime gifts beyond my annual exemption amount, um, then, so if I gift $100,000 to my nephew, say, then um, I have to report that gift to the feds on a federal gift tax return. There's not gonna be any tax due at this point in time, but it's a, it's a reporting requirement at the Fed level, but again, not in Washington state. And the way that that works is, as I said earlier, the, um, the federal exemption amount is this 11,700,000. And so the gift tax is tied to that, meaning throughout my lifetime, I can gift up to $11,700,000 before there's gonna be any exposure. So say that I gift 11 million during my lifetime because I've really reached my <laughs> goal of having a tax problem. Um, so I gift 11 million during my lifetime and then I die. That means I have seven mil or 700,000, the difference between the total estate and gift tax exemption amount of 11.7 less my lifetime gift of 11 million. So I have $700,000 that remains um, that my estate, that, that is gonna be my new estate tax exemption. So they're tied to each other the gift and the estate tax. And uh, I see a question, do you have to give before you die? No, you don't have to give you before you die at all. Um, but in Washington, if you have a, an estate that is above that $2,193,000 exemption amount, and it makes sense given, you know, your, your living requirements, your expense requirements, your age, you know, what your trajectory is in terms of your retirement, et cetera, if it makes sense for you to make gifts during your lifetime to avoid the Washington estate tax, sometimes that is, um, you know, gifting is a, is a big part of estate planning when it makes sense, given the numbers. So you don't have to gift during your lifetime, but you certainly can. And we certainly do um, as part of an overall plan sometimes when that makes sense. So moving on from kind of this um, kind of intro to the estate and gift tax, what are the foundational pieces, the foundational tools that we use? for a proper estate plan, to have you know, all of our ducks in a row, so to speak, to have our um, foundational documents buttoned up. And what I think, and what I tell clients is, I think the most important document is the durable power of attorney. And the reason that I say that is this document takes effect immediately, um, meaning you know, you're not necessarily having somebody who's ultimately right away assigned the job of agent. They don't ultimately immediately start acting, but it's something that takes effect during your lifetime. 
And that means I'm still living when this document's effective. And what happens with my finances during my lifetime and what happens with my healthcare during my lifetime is far more important in my eyes than what happens to my stuff one day after I'm gone. And so that's why I say as a part of the foundational pieces, this one is very, very important. Um, And it will take effect immediately for healthcare purposes. And then either immediately or upon incapacity for financial purposes. Um, And a durable power of attorney is only going to be effective during your lifetime and it loses its effectiveness upon your death. So at the moment that I breathe my last breath, my agent under power of attorney is essentially discharged from their duties um, because that document no longer in effect. It's only in effect during the person's lifetime. So during, um, during the, the, my lifetime, if I'm the person making the durable power of attorney, what it does is it allows your agent to handle finances and work with healthcare providers on your behalf while you're still living. But if you're for some reason unable to take care of things yourself, it, um, it effectively, you know, put somebody on deck, so to speak, to be able to step in if necessary to assist with finances and assist with healthcare decisions in the event that I'm incapacitated and not able to do so. We see this a lot um, and we, we see, you know, the use of this type of a tool a lot with parents, aging parents, aging grandparents. And we oftentimes think of specifically um, like Alzheimer's dementia situations and end of life care. Like I've had an accident or I have, you know, I'm terminally ill and now I am in a permanent vegetative state and I'm not going to have any quality of life. Does the person that you're acting on behalf want long-term, you know, life support, um, artificial food and hydration? We really think of kind of those types of circumstances, the most dire circumstances when we're talking about this document, but it's effective, you know, very much before that. I have a number of clients who have children who are going off to college, um, you know, it's back to school season and, you know, they want to make sure that now that their child is 18, that they have properly, you know, appointed um, an agent for healthcare and an agent for finances. And, you know, even I'm 38, but even as a 38 year old, I have a valid durable power of attorney to ensure that if something were to happen to me, or if something were to happen far, far in the future, that I have somebody on deck, so to speak, to be able to step in and make sure my mortgage is paid, make sure my income tax return is filed, make sure that my credit card bill is paid. You know, all the things that I manage in my own life financially now, because I can, because I'm capable. Um, If something were to happen to me either for a season and I was, you know, going to make a full recovery or for, you know, a longer term illness where I was not going to, you know, be um, making a full recovery and be back, you know, fully capacitated to make sure that my financial life doesn't come apart, so to speak. Um, The other side of that is having an agent appointed for healthcare. And what that means is, again, you know, if I'm either incapacitated for a season or for a long duration, making sure that the appointed person of my choosing is able to speak with healthcare providers on my behalf, direct my care, um, if that becomes necessary. And then certainly in those end of life circumstances to make sure that the, um, you know, that the proper procedures are um, put in place and proper steps are taken with respect to, you know, how I ultimately want to either be permitted to die naturally or to have, you know, a longer term life support, pain medication, et cetera. Um, This looks like a couple. Okay. Those aren't questions for me. Those are questions for Beverly. Okay. So, Um, A couple of things that um, I like to let folks know when they're thinking about durable powers of attorney are what's required for them to be validly executed. Well, it has to be signed, it has to be dated, and it needs to either be acknowledged before a notary, meaning you sign it before a notary, or that you sign it before two disinterested witnesses. And I'm the principal when I'm drafting the power of attorney for myself, so I need to sign and date it before a notary or in front of two witnesses. And the, um, the thing that's really important with selecting agents for finances and for healthcare, something important to, to know is it doesn't have to be the same person. So it can be one person for finances and one person for healthcare, because if you think about who your people are or who your children are, people have different um, strong suits. Um, you know, you might have a, you know, daughter who has, you know, six kids and five dogs and four cats. 
So maybe having her manage your finances is going to be, you know, pretty time consuming, but she's also a nurse or some other type of a healthcare worker, um, or at least just very comfortable in that space in terms of making, you know, being your advocate and making sure that your healthcare is properly managed. But it may make sense to have, you know, your friend serve as agent for finances because that person, you know, has, um, you know, a good track record of how they manage their own household finances. You know, they're a saver like you or, you know, whatever things that um, are important to you in terms of how that person is going to manage finances on your behalf for your benefit. It might be that it's, it's two different people in those roles. Sometimes it's the same person. Oftentimes it is. It just depends on who your people are, what's important to you, and what makes sense for you personally. Okay, so what, is, what are some of the other um, foundational tools? Well, a will, um, this is something that we're probably all familiar with. We've all heard of it, of course, um, but this is going to be probably nine times out of 10, nine and a half times out of 10 for Washingtonians. Um, a simple will is a very, very good um, foundational planning tool. The reason being is that here in Washington, it is not as onerous to go through the probate process as it is in some other states. That's why wills are far more popular than the alternative, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, which is the revocable living trust. So what exactly is a will? Well, it's a document that it doesn't become effective until you're gone, so you're deceased. Um, you can change it anytime in advance of death or in advance of incapacity. And it is basically a roadmap. It provides, um, it appoints someone to serve as executor or personal representative. So, you know, those terms are used somewhat interchangeably. That person's charged with gathering all of your assets, all the assets of the deceased person, finding out who the creditors are, making sure that all creditors appropriately are paid, um, and then ultimately distributing the person's assets according to the roadmap, according to the terms of the will, the directions that are there. After the person dies, a will gets filed with the court um, and a probate may be open depending on you know, whether or not it's required. Um, and that depends on if there's real estate in the estate, for example, then you're gonna have to do a probate. Um, or if you have assets that don't pass otherwise, like via contract or in a joint tenancy account, something like that, that are over $100,000. Um, and it's again, it's okay to go through the probate process because it's not as onerous as it is in some other places, it has a bit of a bad rap, but here in Washington, it's, it's not um, as, as <laughs> negative as it sounds in some other states. Oh, I have somebody with a really good question. Are powers of attorney paid? So that's a great question. When you have an agent under your power of attorney, or for example, when you have an executor or personal representative serving under your will, those folks do not have to serve for free. There is no involuntary servitude here. So um, they are completely entitled to be paid and really should be um, because if you've ever served in either of those roles, you know that it's a lot of work. It is a, it's, it's not an honor, it is a job. Um, and sometimes people forget that when they're thinking about, well, you know, I have to name my oldest because they're my oldest, but it really is a job. And so naming the right person for the job is very important. But also, um, you know, statutorily, they're, they're, a, they're allowed to be paid a reasonable sum. You can leave an extra gift for them should you so choose. Um, but as long as, you know, as long as they're actually serving, um, they just, you know, need to track their time and they can be reimbursed for out-of-pocket expenses and also paid for their time spent um, working on those tasks for, for your benefit. So getting back to our conversation about wills, what's required? for a validly executed will. Well, it has to be written and it has to be signed by the testator, by me if it's my will that I'm making for myself and by two or more competent witnesses in the presence of the testator. So basically, if you've you know, ever executed a will um, or ever you know, kind of seen on TV what, what that looks like, um, you just need it, it to be in a writing. It needs to be signed by me. So I sign in front of my two witnesses and they each sign that I signed in front of them and then it's valid. So it's, it's pretty simple, but one thing that sort of trips people up, and a lot of times um, we'll see this after someone has died, maybe they're sick and they type something up and don't sign it, um, or they sign it, but it's not witnessed. Um, so making sure that it is written, it is signed, um, and that it is signed before two witnesses to ensure that validity. 
so this is just a cute cartoon. I'd like a will prepared, nine to be exact, because cats have nine lives. So they have nine estate plans, I guess. So in terms of um, the alternative to a will, we have the revocable living trust. And this is um, if you, you know, ever lived in California or if you have friends there, that is a state where everybody uses a revocable trust because the probate system there is expensive and it takes a long time. It's a general pain in the, in the neck <laughs> in the legal sense of the phrase. And so, like I said before in Washington, um, we don't use them as much. Um, we do use them when they're appropriate for, for a client, but we um, are often, clients are often very well served using a will because the probate process isn't as onerous as it is in some other places. But what does a revocable trust do? Well, we said about wills that they don't, they're not activated, so to speak, until the person dies. Whereas a revocable trust is active during your lifetime. So I set up a trust for myself. Um, I put my house in it. I put my investment account in the name of the trust. You can think about it kind of like a box. It's an entity that holds title to assets while you're living. So instead of owning my house as Tiffany Gorton, an individual, I would own it as Tiffany Gorton, trustee of the Tiffany Gorton Trust. Same with my investment account or with other assets that I'm going to use to fund um, to put into the trust during lifetime. So if it's properly funded during life, that means that you've transferred your title to your assets to the trust, um, then probate proceedings at death will not be necessary. So you can avoid that step. Um, it also, when I recommend it um, for folks, most often is if they have out-of-state real estate. So if you, you know, own a place in California, for example, or you have a place in Oregon or Idaho or any state that's not Washington, when you die, you have to go through an ancillary probate process in each of those other states where you have real estate in order to take your name off title and transfer it to your heirs or beneficiaries. So when I recommend that folks use a revocable trust is if you do have real estate in multiple states, that way you don't have to have a probate in Washington and a probate in Oregon you know, where your other piece of real estate is located. If you just title the property in the name of your trust during your lifetime, then you avoid probate in multiple states. So that is um, when it becomes really attractive for Washingtonians is when they have out-of-state real estate. Um, in terms of when other times that we would use this, um, sometimes folks just say, you know what, I, I moved here from California, I have a revocable trust, I'm comfortable with that tool, it's already funded. So then we'll just make some adjustments to make sure that it works for Washington. And then they can carry on, you know, using that trust as their primary estate planning tool. Um, sometimes folks will say, I'm just familiar with it because my parents had one and I, you know, I, I administered that after they were gone. And so really it's, it's entirely up to you which tool you use. And it's okay if it's just a matter of, I'm for, more familiar with this. Um, but when, when I would high, highly recommend it to clients is really that out-of-state real estate scenario. Um, sometimes folks are interested in using them for a little bit of privacy. And what I mean by that is, like I said before, when a person dies with a will, the will gets filed with the court. Um, so regardless of whether probate's necessary, when someone dies and they have a will, that does get filed with the court. And so... Um, if you have somebody who, you know, a black sheep of the family, so to speak, or somebody who might make some trouble, um, trusts are not filed with the court. The only folks that are entitled to see the trust are the trustee and the beneficiaries. And so sometimes keeping that out of the court um, file can be a little bit of a deterrent because it kind of creates an extra hoop for folks to jump through if they want to contest it. And so that can be a little bit attractive, just depending on, you know, people are going to litigate if they want to litigate, um, unfortunately, you know, whether it's frivolous or not, but making sure that, um, you know, there's just an extra barrier there. So that's another time when folks sometimes will, will opt for the revocable trust. So we talked a lot about avoiding probate um, as part of the um, kind of selection of estate planning tools. Let me answer one quick question and then we'll, we're gonna get into this next slide. So there's a question of, should you allow for a specific amount in your will to pay the POA or can they themselves pay themselves from the proceeds? So it depends. Um, sometimes folks will pay themselves as they go when they're serving as agent under power of attorney um, and that's totally appropriate. Sometimes they'll just track their time and then make a claim against the estate for the time to be paid. That's okay too. 
Um, and sometimes folks say, you know what, I would like to leave something in my will for my agent that's above and beyond, you know, what they're entitled to, or I'm going to leave them $50,000 and that's going to be their payment. So you can do it any number of ways that you prefer. Um, if you want to leave a gift for them in your will, you can, but if you don't, or if you forget to, um, they're going to get, they're able to get paid otherwise. So it just depends on the circumstances, um, on what you anticipate that that person's going to have to do. Um, and if you, you know, want to be additionally generous to them, then you certainly can include a gift in your will. And then there was a question of rollover will with revocable living trust, what, why, and when use. This is a pour over will. So um, I, anytime I draft a revocable living trust for a client, I always draft what's called the pour over will. And basically that will, which is pretty short, says, if I forgot to put something in my trust during my lifetime, put it there now that I'm dead. And if for some reason my trust is invalid, distribute everything under my estate according to the roadmap provided in my trust. So it's a little bit of a belt and suspenders. It makes sure that things pour into the trust document at death if you forgot something. Just make sure that everything kind of gets scooped up and flows according to the roadmap in the trust. That's what a pour over will is. And I say, I use that anytime I draft a trust just because people sometimes will forget about assets um, that they wanted to use to fund their trust or they forget about that life insurance policy, for example, that has no beneficiary on it, something like that. Making sure that everything just kind of gets the safety net, so to speak, that pours things into the trust if there was um, for forgetting about it during lifetime or otherwise, just making sure that it has a place to go. So there's no question as to the distribution at the end of the day. So getting back to what I was saying before, um, we talk a lot about avoiding probate. Probate, As I said, here in Washington, it's not as onerous as it is in some other places, um, but what is it? Because a lot of times people haven't gone through it. They maybe haven't administered a parent's estate or otherwise, and unless you're me and you spend your whole day thinking about trust and estate, you don't have, you know, a lot of, you don't serve a lot as executor. Um, some people go a whole lifetime never serving. And so what probate is, is it's a court supervised process um, that essentially kind of administers, it gathers a deceased person's assets um, and then settles up their debts, any, you know, outstanding debt that they had at death, any creditors that they have, they are, they are paid. And then ultimately the assets are transferred to the beneficiaries, either under the terms of their will or under the laws of intestacy, if they didn't have a will at all, or a trust as an alternate. Um, so the court gives the personal representative or the executor the power to basically settle the estate of a deceased person by issuing what's called letters testamentary. That's a one-page document that says, Tiffany Gorton is the executor of the Mr. Smith estate, and Tiffany has the authority to sell Mr. Smith's house and otherwise administer you know, his, his assets. So that means I can deal with the real estate agent, I can sell the house, I collect the proceeds, I open a state bank account, I hold the proceeds there, gather the other assets, I give notice to creditors, I say, hey creditors, Mr. Smith has died, if you want to be paid, speak now or forever hold your peace, you need to file your claim. Then I analyze the creditors' claims that come in, if there are any, making sure they're legitimate, and I pay them pay final cost of illness, final, you know, hospital bills, um, you know, final credit card bill, et cetera. All those things that, you know, we're, that we pay every month or, you know, at some point um, come kind of come to come due, so to speak. And so those things get paid. And then ultimately the assets get distributed according to the terms of the will or under the laws of intestacy. Um, the executor, here's just another slide about that notifying the, the creditors, you know, gathering the assets, filing um, final income tax return. So if I died today, um, my executor would have to file my last income tax return for tax year 2021, which again, you know, we all pay taxes, right? So that's gonna be due April 15th of 2022. So my executor would file my final income tax return, pay any taxes due, collect a refund if that's due, um, and then uh, make sure that any um, estate taxes, if I had to file an estate tax return because my estate was um, above that $2 million level here in Washington or above $11.7 million in, at the federal level. Um, so if any estate tax return has to be filed, then my executor would do that. 
And then ultimately, um, after everything was administered, all parties, you know, all creditors are paid, um, all debts are paid, um, all taxes are settled up, so to speak, then make distributions of those assets under the terms of my will. And that's, in a nutshell, what kind of the, what the probate process is. So non-probate assets. Now, these are assets that pass according to the terms of their own contract. They don't have to go through probate. So if you have assets that are titled as joint tenancy with right of survivorship, um, JTWROS sometimes, and, and often we think about our joint checking account or our joint savings account, often with a spouse. Um, sometimes maybe we have a child on that account. If you have any accounts that are titled with a joint tenant who has rights of survivorship, what that means is if I have my son on my account as a joint tenant and I die, those assets in that account, those funds are going to automatically belong to my son. They're not going to flow through probate. They're not going to be um, distributed under the terms of my will or my, my trust. They're going to go right to my joint tenant. Now, people don't realize that. And sometimes inadvertently, um, I should back up. Part of my practice, in addition to estate planning and um, probate and trust administration, is I do a lot of trust and estate dispute work, so litigation. When something happens after someone's deceased, things have gone awry, and there's a lawsuit, I'm oftentimes representing a party in circumstances like that. And one thing that I see often is, you know, maybe mom had a very large account. She put oldest child on the account thinking that they could help write checks to make sure bills are paid, but inadvertently made that oldest child a, a joint tenant of that account with rights of survivorship. And then she dies oldest child owns those funds now and she had two other kids that are not going to receive any of that account she probably didn't un intend that so we see disputes about that a lot because some banks even have their default as a joint tenancy with rights of survivorship for whatever reason so making sure that any accounts that you have that are titled um, like that just make sure that you intend that the joint tenant receive those assets one day when you're dead it's okay if you have those accounts it's not a bad thing just making sure that you understand what that means um, and that that's your intent. So question, um, is a, an account that's joint tenant the same as a POD, pay and death account? No, it's not. So um, that is the last bullet point here, transfer on death or pay on death account, TOD or POD. So sometimes we'll have accounts that aren't jointly owned by another person, but I say, you know what, this is my account and I wanna leave this account to my nephew. So I'm gonna put him on as the transfer on death or the pay on death beneficiary. And that is different because my, my nephew doesn't own that, own that account immediately when I die, but he's a named beneficiary. So it's, sort, it's somewhat similar, but it is different. Um, and it's another time where you need to make sure that uh, that the pay on death beneficiary or the transfer on death beneficiary designation matches what your current intentions are. Um, so, because those things are going to they're going to pass automatically to the named beneficiary versus passing according to the terms of the will. Um, property that's subject to a community property agreement. So, if you are married um, or in a committed intimate type relationship, oftentimes we'll have community property type agreements that says, I want everything to go to the surviving partner at death. Um, and then assets will indeed transfer under that agreement to that surviving partner at death and not have to go through the probate process. It's different than a will. Um, property held in trust. So property that's in my revocable living trust is not gonna go through probate. That's a non-probate asset. Similarly, life insurance policies. Life insurance policies, there is a beneficiary designation associated with it. It's going to pass automatically. Um, and by automatically, I mean, usually the person has to submit a death certificate to the insurance company, and then it pays out directly to the beneficiary that's named. So those assets are not going to pass through probate. They're not going to be governed by the terms of your will. So it's okay if you have other beneficiaries or owners on these various accounts, but you just want to make sure that your whole overall plan so the beneficiaries under your will comports with whoever you have listed on your account. Or if you say, I want this one a policy to go to one of my children for specific reasons, that's okay. Um, just make sure that what you have designated on these various types of non-probate assets, um, that your current intentions are reflected there. 
Okay, so a couple questions. Asset inventory, where to find format, details on how detailed and what all to include required by Washington Probate Court. Okay, so for an asset inventory, that's something that um, you're getting a little bit granular in terms of what an executor does. But one of the things that he's charged with doing with an estate is providing an inventory of the estate to the beneficiaries. If you're looking for forms um, or examples of what that type of a form looks like, there's a website called, I think it's called WashingtonProbate.com. If you just type Washington Probate into Google, you'll go to that website. And um, that was set up by an attorney and he has a lot of helpful uh, tools like that. So you might find something like that there. Um, does joint tenancy reduce estate size? No. So say that I have an account that I have my oldest child as a joint tenant with right of survivorship, a $5 million account. That's not true in my life, but I wish it were. But in my example, I got this $5 million account. I've got my son as a joint tenant with right of survivorship. Just because that asset passes to him via joint tenancy at my death, that asset is still going to be counted when we're looking at my overall estate. That $5 million in that account still counts with respect to my estate because I still technically own it at my death. It just passes um, to my son according to the tenant, joint tenancy arrangement, but it's still an asset that's countable for estate tax purposes. Okay. And then I just wanted to touch really quick because this is another um, thing that folks have heard a lot about over the last couple of years is the SECURE Act, um, setting every community up for retirement enhancement. And this was effective last January. Um, so you've probably encountered it or read something about it or heard something about it on the news. Um, and there's a couple of different components to it. But what I wanted to just touch on is that it did change um, the rules with respect to inherited IRAs, individual retirement accounts. And so most beneficiaries are going to have to um, take funds out of an IRA that they inherit within a 10-year period. So either all at once or in increments over the course of 10 years. There's a couple of exceptions for that. And that's folks who are permanently disabled. They fall under a very specific definition um, of the SECURE Act or a surviving spouse. So take a look at, um, you know, take a look at that and take a look at your retirement accounts just to make sure and, and just be cognizant of the fact that um, if you have a named beneficiary on your account, that person is very, very likely to have to take all the distributions from that account over the course of 10 years. So within 10 years of the date of death. Um, there is some trust planning that can happen um, with respect to those types of assets because sometimes folks will say, hey, I have a five-year-old, but I have a really big retirement account. If something were to happen to me tomorrow, this means that, you know, upon, you know, they turn 18 and that starts that 10-year clock. So by the time they're 28, they're going to have to take all, all the assets in my big retirement account. I don't want to give my, you know, little kid all of those assets um, or all of the proceeds over that 10-year period because I think they're too young. So sometimes the the tax benefit out or the um, practicality, the practical benefit outweighs the tax benefit, so to speak. And so there is some trust planning that you can do with respect to those retirement accounts if it's not if it makes sense given your circumstances. So sometimes people, when they were reading about the SECURE Act or hearing about that, understanding that, oh man, my beneficiaries only have 10 years, but I have minor children. And I don't think that they're going to, you know, that they should get all those funds between 18 and 28. Um, and so making some, some additional plans under, under trust language, either in the terms of your will or in a revocable living trust, there are some options for that. You just need to um, make sure that they make sense for you and make sure that you utilize them so that you're not, um, you don't fall into the category of, you know, everybody else who, you know, has the general rule of the SECURE Act apply to them. Okay, uh, quick question here. Is a POD or a pay on death account value included in taxable assets? The answer is yes. So getting back to kind of some of that list of, of, of types of assets. So if you have a joint tenancy account, if you have a transfer on death account, meaning it's an investment account and I say transfer on death or pay on death my nephew, all of those assets are still included in your estate for estate tax purposes. They just happen to pass differently. They don't have to go through the probate process in order to be distributed, but they are still very much includable in your estate. Any assets that you own in your individual capacity 
whether there's a joint tenant on the account or a beneficiary you've designated on the account or on the policy, um, any assets that you own in your revocable living trust at your desk. All of those assets are gonna be counted for estate tax purposes. Now, there are some other types of trusts that are tools for tax planning. The revocable living trust is not one of them. It doesn't eliminate estate tax exposure. Um, but there are some irrevocable trusts, meaning I can't revoke them. I are at the beginning of that word, irrevocable. And sometimes folks, when they have assets that are above um, the tax exemption level and they're in a place where it's appropriate for them to make lifetime gifts, like we talked about a little bit at the beginning of the session, sometimes folks will make lifetime gifts to these special types of trusts for the benefit of others, not their own revocable trust, but for the benefit of other beneficiaries. And once those completed gifts are made into those other specific types of trust, then those assets would not be included for estate tax purposes in the decedent's estate. So there is some, there is a some, there are some trusts out there that are very specific tax planning vehicles, um, and similar to you know outright gifts to beneficiaries during life. Meaning, I give my nephew a hundred thousand dollars, like I said at the beginning, just outright. Um, some of that gifting, th those types of gifts get those assets out of your estate. So they're not going to be countable for estate tax purposes. But anything that you own at death, either in an account, um, in your revocable trust, or otherwise, those assets are all going to be countable for um, calculating exposure to the estate tax. So does Washington accept community property agreement to allow the entire community property to pass to the surviving spouse and not 50-50? So in Washington, we talked a little bit about um, property subject to a community property agreement. So that's agreement among spouses, and it basically provides when I die, everything I own goes to my husband, Nick, outright and free of trust. Everything goes to him uh, under my, the terms of my community property agreement. All the community assets go to, go to Nick. And so, yes, that agreement provides that all the assets are going to flow to Nick. They're all going to be owned by him, but it doesn't provide what happens. It doesn't provide any tax planning for estate tax purposes, and it doesn't um, provide what happens at the second spouse's death. So if some spouses, Nick and I, my husband, just had a community property agreement, we would need wills in order to ensure that the second spouse's death doesn't just leave assets passing via intestacy. So spouse one dies, I die first under my community property agreement, everything goes to Nick. But then Nick will have to execute a will at that time in order to make sure that he directs where his assets go after he dies, because he has everything now in his estate. And the other issue there is there's not an estate tax planning mechanism to maximize the use of my exemption amount, my $2 million exemption amount for Washington, or $11.7 million at the Fed level under a community property agreement. So just be aware of that if that's a tool that you're planning to use. Is there a website for documents that can be prepared by an individual, will, power of attorney, et cetera? So um, that's a great question. Yes, you do not have to have an attorney prepare those documents. You can certainly prepare them yourself. Um, my late law partner, Tim, used to say, I could wire my own house, but I wanna live there. And so from my perspective, I think it, um, it, it can be, there's, there's a lot of value in having um, some specific legal advice due to, you know, to your specific circumstances, but you can certainly, um, draft your own document should you so choose. And the um, I think that the Washington probate site might have some similar tools for that. Um, maybe not. But certainly, um, you know, if you just Google, you know, will powers of attorney, et cetera, you'll get a number of different um, sites that allow you to draft those yourself. You can generate your own documents, <clears throat> state specific, and then print them and sign them. Um, and I know that the PMA might have on their website um, specifics for powers of attorney. Is that right, Beverly? No, we don't, since the legal side of things is a little bit outside of our expertise. Okay. So we would generally say, well, you better ask Tiffany. She's the, <laughs> she's the expert. <laughs> right. So ask Tiffany. Well, I know that there are a lot of people in our community, uh, in the PMA community, who are also involved in um, compassion and choices. Mm -hmm. um, which is another really wonderful organization. And they do have on their website, at least for healthcare, um, a pretty extensive 
power of attorney for healthcare. So that's one place that you could look. And I think um, there is either it's King County or Washington State. Um, but again, if you do a Google search for that and, and put in Washington as part of the search term, um, there are some like neighborhood legal clinics. And I think it is through the King County Bar Association now that I'm saying this. Um, and they'll have some forms for durable powers of attorney that folks can use. I'll make sure to include links to those uh, organizations in the follow-up email so that way you all can um, kind of vet your options before committing to a particular attorney. Okay, awesome. And then that's my husband and I doing some outdoor signings <laughs> of estate planning client documents during, during the pandemic. So stay safe out there. Um, and here is all my contact information, which Beverly is going to put uh, in the email to everyone as well. So you'll have a copy of my slides. Um, and my contact information. So should you have any additional questions, feel free to email me, put PMA in the subject line, PMA question, and that way um, I'll know where that's coming from and I'm happy to, happy to help. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tiffany. You always just bring so much interesting information along with you. I've sat through so many of these and I swear every time you <laughs> Um, you did such a great job addressing these questions as they rolled in, so I'd like to encourage folks to please drop any additional questions that you have into the chat or the Q&A feature. We still have a few minutes left, and I don't want you wandering right away with questions still bugging you. Um, yeah, and as Tiffany said, I will be sending out a follow-up email with a recording of today's session along with her slides. There's so much good information on there, and I know especially on the slides where you have all the numbers in the table, it'd be a little tricky to jot all those down for a reference point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, well, thank you, Beverly. It was so good to see you. And thanks to everyone for, for showing up and for the questions. And like I say, if you come up with something after the fact, um, I'm happy to help. So feel free to shoot me an email. Yeah, um, sure. Just looks like lots of effusive thank yous from the attendees. Yeah, <laughs> thank you all for being here. This, is, this has been fun and it's been a little while, a couple months, I think, since, mm -hmm. um, since I've done one of these. So I'm really happy to be um, back on screen again. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, so no worries. It looks like, yeah, just everyone is so thankful. We know that it can be a little challenging when you decide it's finally time to really dig in and figure out what your wishes are and how to document them. And so it's series like this that we try to help you kind of get your start on that. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either us or Tiffany. Um, and I'll make sure you have access to that information for those bar associations. A lot of those folks are very generous with their time to see what they can do for you for free, which is, I know is a big selling point for lots of families. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, and I do see that somebody's in Oregon. Um, so if you, the person who's in Oregon, if you would like a recommendation, I do know a number of attorneys that practice down there. So feel free to shoot me an email and, and I can send you a couple of folks that might be uh, useful tools for you, so to speak. You're so connected. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Yeah. Um, and expect that. I know someone was curious kind of what the timeline was on when to expect that email. It'll probably be a couple of days. Um, I've got to get everything sort of cleaned up and organized for you. Um, but, you know, stay in touch. That's what we're here for, to make sure that folks have information they need to make informed choices and, you know, not end up pressured in anything that's not a good fit for them and their families. So thank you so much for joining us in that mission. Um, I'm still not seeing any questions. You must have been so thorough that everyone's just... <laughs> On the, on the track already to get everything taken care of. Well, I'll go ahead and close out today's session. Thank you so much, everyone, for